And welcome to the Pod on the Pendulum, the horror movie podcast, covering all the franchises, one movie and one episode at a time. I'm your host, Mike Snoonian, and this week we're back with more secret filming, more demonic activity, more domestic strife, and more wondering why the hell they don't just put the camera down and run out the door. It's time for Paranormal Activity 4. Woo! Oh boy. <laughs> It's a doozy. What a picture. But I'm not alone. God, I would not want to stay in a house like this alone. Like, there's too many creeps and scrapes and buzzes and things that go bump in the night. I mean, the pets alone freak me out. So I'm, I'm, I'm covered here. I've got all my co-hosts with me today. Joining us again this week after stepping into the big chair last week from the Spectre Cinema Club, Mr. Devon Taylor. Devon, how are we? Hello, hello. I am fantastic. I hope uh, this is the audience's uh, listening choice during their glow-in-the-dark dance party. <laughs> uh, you know, this movie can't be all bad with a Dragula needle drop. Nope, nothing can be with a Dragula needle drop, right? Exactly. I was, I was actually, I totally forgot about that, and I was like, oh my god, yes. 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 I love that. I think it's, I think that's a top, I don't know, maybe 50 song of all time. I know that might be crazy, but... I think it's a phenomenal joint. It's a fun one. It might be his best. I like Rob. Secret Rob Zombie fan, like secretly a little bit bummed out that his concert this year is playing the same night as Bikini Kill. And he can Mm. only pick one. And like, I'll probably never get to see Bikini Kill again. So that's going to be the choice. Um, But I would love to go see Rob Zombie live. I guarantee he puts on like a super fun show. It's like him and Alice Cooper... And I want to say, like, Helmet, but I'm probably wrong about that. So, but anyway, totally diver- already, like, off track, 20 <laughs> seconds in. Um, also joining us again, uh, not painting a bathroom today. So, like, had a choice of <laughs> recording or painting a bathroom. So happy that we made the cut. Ari, how are we? Ario Hellraiser herself. I'm doing great because I'm not doing house chores and I'm hanging out with you all. I'd rather be haunted by a demon named Toby than paint walls. So I'm doing great today. Painting is the worst. It Painting is, like is the, the most worst. boring chore. In... It's, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah. But in with us for the first time in a little while and in for her first paranormal activity movie. She's the co-host of Halloweenies. She's the co-host of Girls and the Boys. She's a writer for Bloody Disgusting, amongst others. Rachel Reeves is back. Rachel, how are we? Hi. I'm so happy to be here and so excited I could jump on for some of these paranormal activity movies. Wicked pumped to have you. Yeah. Super excited to talk about these. I've never really had the opportunity to talk about these. And these movies freak me out. Mm -hmm. And some more than others. So I'll save my thoughts on where I land on this one. Yeah. But yeah, stoked to to jump in on these. And Toby, oh God, what a creep. <laughs> Toby is a world-class creep. Let's definitely give it up for that. <laughs> well, why don't you kick things off for us? Because we've kind of all given our thoughts on the series as a whole and our history with it in our earlier episodes. And I'm curious, like, what's your own history with this franchise? Like, uh, was it like a saw where it was like, hey, opening night, we're there, you know, like if it's October, it must be. Um, were you there every year, like when these were getting churned out, or did you find this later? I found it a little bit later. I didn't catch it in the theaters, but caught it once it hit physical media. Mm-hmm. And man, found footage just gets to me. Like it creeps me out. Like home invasion horror in general is something that actually really unnerves me. And I feel like a, like this one in particular has like some crossover with that subgenre. Um, and so I, it, ugh. yeah, the first one really creeped me out and it made me a little nervous to like venture forward because i was like so creeped out um 
But then the second one, I was like, eh, that's okay. The third one, like, is pretty good. It's yeah. pretty great, you guys. <laughs> third, third one is, is my... the Dream Warriors of the series, I would say. Yeah, third one's pretty awesome. So that, like, was like, all right, I'm back in. Um, and then kind of dropped off after I saw this one. But then, like, bought a Blu-ray set of all of them. And then went back all through all of them, and so now now I'm fully on the train. I think like I think that they're, they're not all great, but mm-hmm. I do have a lot of fun with them. And there are moments I will say like there's not a single one that doesn't have something about it that makes me like a little uneasy. Like okay, yep, got me. They got me yeah. there. So I, I appreciate that about this one, and overall think it's a pretty solid franchise. Yeah. Do you all think? Because it feels like this series. It was a massive success. Like, it's a nearly a billion dollar franchise overall. It doesn't seem to get the same sort of nostalgic love that, say, like a Saw gets. And it's kind of a contemporary of it. Like, it came out a few years later, but, you know, starting in 2009 to 2004, it's not too much different. Why do we feel there's not the same sense of nostalgia for the paranormal activity movies that say a saw or even like a final destination has i mean i think it's the i think it's the found footage for sure mm-hmm. found footage has always been a, a hit and miss subgenre for a lot of people a lot of people it's either they love uh found footage or they supremely dislike it a lot of the times but then especially around this time was when we were getting like a you know big flux on between like 2010 and 2014 we were getting like like almost overly saturated with a lot of different found footage films so i could see how as the series progresses on people not being as on board with it even though the films as uh, we've kind of mentioned in each episode, like they make different attempts to switch up the different found footage styles within the series. But uh, I think just around this time specifically, this was uh, 2012, um, it, that I think there was just a lot of found footage uh, just kind of burn out just because of the, the saturation for it. I think it's the characters too, because, you know, you look at Blair Witch and it's kind of that first one feels very singular, standalone. It doesn't give you time to get tired of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the oversaturation of found footage in general at this time. Also, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of those characters. It's not easy to love them. I mean, even Katie, it's like you can like her in the first few, but I kind of I'm over her yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly as it goes on. Right. And so it's hard to have the same feelings of nostalgia when I, it's like, okay, yep. Hi, Katie. Nice to right. see you. Good to see you again. Hair still looks great. <laughs> like, how you been? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, that, that takes away from it. Whereas if paranormal activity was a one, one and done, one hit wonder kind of thing, I think we would feel completely different about it. It's just the fact we've had so many after that, which isn't a bad thing. Don't mind the franchise, but it, I don't have the same feelings towards yeah. it because, yeah, still have it. It's still around. It also has to start competing um, with Insidious and The Conjuring. Yeah. And The Conjuring really took off. And so I think a lot of people were getting kind of their creepy paranormal fix there. Mm-hmm. And as Devon was saying about found footage not being everybody's favorite, you could go get your creepy paranormal fix without found footage. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think there's kind of a lot, kind of a lot of reasons. Maybe just a little bit more time, and we'll look back on this more fondly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems feels like even a series that like Blumhouse wants to go away. Like after the last one, mm-hmm. I think like Jason Blum is like, eh, maybe it's time to put this one to rest. Like it doesn't seem like he uh, wants to kind of continue making any more of these, which is odd, just because like. Their whole model of like, let's make these really inexpensive movies. And even this one, which I think we'll talk about here in a second, even though there's a bit of a drop off, like it's still like insanely successful. Like people Mm -hmm. are still and even the ones that people, quote unquote, stop turning out for. um, If that was like a one off movie, it would be considered like pretty successful. And it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of took that approach where kind of what they I don't know if this is what they did with next of kin but it feels like it's almost like they have a story Mm -hmm. and just kind of 
put it in the paranormal activity mold mm. yeah. where and kind of just start to use the term paranormal activity. It's just it's completely separate. It's just a standalone movie that has some very loose thematic ties sure. to the others. You know, like VHS almost, where it's just completely different, but we're just going to call it a paranormal activity movie because that IP will help sell tickets and sort of move a little bit more yeah. into that direction, which I don't think would be a bad choice. Well, it's kind of what Evil Dead has done, right? Like the past mm -hmm. two Evil Dead movies don't have anything to do with like Ash and the original three movies. Um, but they're still tied into that same universe. And they're still, I mean, granted, like they have a lot more in common with like the first three Evil Dead movies. Um, they're still within that same universe. And as long as you, like you said, tie in a few things thematically or visually um you know like i mean toby can't be the only demon that's out there oh, exactly you know yeah, maybe like, the next maybe demon's there's... more of a ps5 guy i don't know yeah it's <laughs> got to have like a little bit of a found footage mm -hmm. element and something spooky and that's it i mean that's all honestly it really needs to be like okay that makes sense that it fits under the paranormal activity umbrella yeah, but I, I think I think one thing you know that starkly you know differentiates it between the Evil Dead fran something like the Evil Dead franchise is this one again was trying to take the the Saw formula and being like okay we're gonna put it out put one out every year yeah you know so I think no time in between the films uh, also uh, just kind of made it be like oh my god I can't for some can't people I like, can't ca yeah can't keep up you know yeah. so it's like. You know, Blumhouse, uh, between the way that they approached this franchise and then um, the way that they approached the Purge franchise later on, I mm. think is fascinating. And like kind of some of the lessons Jason Blum might have learned from doing this franchise, because, mm. yes, still successful. But like Mike has pointed out, there was uh, definitely room that you would think it still could have been even bigger. Yeah. Um, but at the time that this came out, this was still helping build Blumhouse, yeah. you know. Yeah, they were going to ride this wagon until the wheels fell off it basically oh. hey you gotta keep the momentum while it's hot you yeah. kind of do yeah i mean that was the 80s formula right like friday the 13th <laughs> in the 80s i think every year but 82 had a movie come out and then you look at like elm street starting in 84 there was like an elm street every year um Halloween, not quite so much, but even they like got to a point where by the late eighties, like they were trying to churn, like look at part four and five, like they're like right back to back with one another. Like they couldn't come out fast enough. So that was kind of what worked in the eighties, like keep it while the iron's heart hot. Um, maybe in part because audience tastes are going to change. Like, you, you know, mm. this is maybe like a certain generation's, franchise and then they get a little bit older they go to college they grow up a little bit and they're like okay i've outgrown this mm -hmm. and uh you're trying to like get it while the iron like while you can until they get too old for it yeah i think they've been evolving their approach to franchises in general because i mean really besides this and the purge they don't really have any other ones i mean yeah a few other films like might have gotten a sequel but like how many Blumhouse movies have there been that were like, we wanted a sequel that they just didn't? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, where is our Happy Death Day freaky crossover? <laughs> um, you know, so it's like they kind of seemingly, you know, except for now we have Megan 2.0 coming out. So we'll see if another that con turns Another into, conjuring. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That too. <laughs> They're not the conjuring, though, right? Like, that's Warner Aren't Brothers. Aren't they? Isn't that Blumhouse? No, no that's, that's Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers. Oh, I thought, they, I thought they had something to do with it. I, I mean, maybe David why. Zasloff will, like, make a new Conjuring and then be like, nah, we're going to just shelve it, tax write off. No one will see it. He'll put <laughs> it in the vault. I would see it. He'll put it in the vault <laughs> next to Wile E. Coyote and Batgirl and just, like, take it as a write off. Like, that would be the Warner Brothers approach at this point. Who knows? Rude. So, well, let's talk a little bit about how this movie got made and Ari do you mind starting things off a little bit for us here most definitely you do mind oh okay I mean, who oh can... no yes. I I did a yeah no yeah okay uh, <laughs> yes I will <clears throat> so a fourth paranormal activity film was first hinted at by Paramount domestic distribution head Don Harris in an interview with The Wrap published on October 23rd, 2011, 
two days after the release of the third film. As of that day, the whole franchise had grossed $450 million on a budget of $8 million. Um, the, third group, the third movie grossing $54 million. So Harris said, I can't imagine that we wouldn't make a number four. And I imagine Paramount Film Group President Adam Goodman this morning is thinking about the challenge. I'm sure he's thinking, now what do I do? So like three days after the third movie comes out, they're swimming in cash. And the he's like, yeah, I will probably make a fourth mm-hmm. one. Like, what will it be so, about? Who cares? You're going to turn <laughs> out anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter. Um, so shortly after that, on January 2nd of 2012, Paranor- Paramount announced that Paranormal Activity 4 was in the works. They said it was going to be a sequel to Paranormal Activity 2, set several years later. So going back to the kind of original timeline after the prequel that was 3. Information about the characters was scarce, stating that Brady Allen was going to play a character named Robbie. And Katie Featherstone reprised her role as Katie, who was still possessed from the ending of the first two films, but the other cast and characters that appeared were kept under wraps. So they're like, okay, sequel to the second one, Katie's coming back, there's a little boy, could it be Hunter? We don't know. So that's how they kind of made that sizzle. Again, it's directed by Ariel Shulman and Henry. Is it Juiced or Used? That's a Used. Good okay. question. Henry Used. Used. And again, written by Christopher Landon from a story by Chad Feehan. So Paramount continued the marketing method of holding demand advanced screenings and airing commercials with footage of audience reaction. They are like, look, this keeps working for us, so we're going to do it again. And they incorporated contemporary technology into the film with the Xbox Connect, which I haven't thought about in years. Like, (laughs) I remember it being a thing at the time, and younger listeners maybe don't remember it at all. It was like Um, the Wii, but less successful. Yeah, Mm. it was maybe one of the first ones to try to do the body capture, Mm -hmm. motion capture, and incorporate it into video games. And they used Skype. Uh, So they wanted to make the film feel realistic um, with technologies that we were using, but keeping the found footage style. And I'm curious, you know, we've talked in our other discussions so far on this franchise about how each film kind of does something different with the found footage. Um, What are our thoughts on using these technologies for the found footage style? I mean, I think Eust and Shulman were so, I mean, they were obviously very tapped into um, everything going on. And, you know, like especially like, you know, making a program for MTV. They are kind of in the, they are in tune with kind of what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think it continues again, like their kind of slight uh, thing that they did in the last movie where they used a new camera, but put it inside of an old camera. So mm-hmm. like the way that they kind of blend the old with the new, I think is fascinating because we do still have a normal handheld camera in this, but then we have um, uh, laptops um, being used a lot, which uh, which will come into play on the why are you still filming? It's a lot harder to run and hold a laptop <laughs> filming. That's awkward. Um, <laughs> but then uh, the yeah Xbox Connect was like the... Thing that xbox were like well we can do what the wii is doing because the wii i don't know if y'all remember the wii took the world by storm it when huge. it first came out oh, oh it, was, yeah. it was it was insane so um and i mean i actually liked it like yeah it seems kind of a little tacky but at the same time he, uh, he only says it once it's not like they like keep repeating right well, yes the xbox connect you know he like says it one time and then they don't really draw attention to and i think they use it in a an effective way Mm -hmm. um and again it just like kind of switches the different slight style like you know because now it's like not only is it from a different source but now we also have kids doing the filming in this one you know previously it all been adults so like now it's the kids that are the ones doing the different styles of filming with the with the adults not understanding how yeah the dad's a doofus I, i like it like the dad doesn't understand <laughs> yeah. like techno like color televisions what like. hey that's accurate my my dad just called me the other day and was like 
asking me questions about Venmo and like, why can I see what everybody's sending money to? What? Mm -hmm. That's okay. a great me, question. Make you know, your Venmo private, people. Turn this off. Go into your privacy settings. So you know, it's very accurate. I I liked the connect thing. I have no idea if that's actually true. Like if you know. turn up, like if you turn off and film it. You know, on that certain setting on a camera is—is is that actually what it I looks think like? It is. I'm, I was—I yes. like, assume like that, it is. That is how it is. How it does work. It has to send out all these different dots to like do the since you don't have a remote in your hand yeah. like you do with the Wii. So that is true. Gotcha. I just. Uh, I never had an infrared night vision camera to actually right. like look at it, but I know that that is true. That's See, so I, cool. I think that's yeah. I think it's super cool, and I actually really like how it works. Actually, with the horror elements of the story, because I do find it really creepy the fact that you can like see like the dots moving it, i feel like that was a really brilliant use of that technology mm -hmm. to show you know a ghost for lack of a better word in a different in a different way because we've seen it presented and we in even in the film we see it with the shadows and moving really fast or whatever objects moving like that's great but push it forward and i think that's such a critical thing for pretty much any found footage movie and so i think that was a really really smart thing to yeah. do here mm -hmm. to make it feel fresh and also make something uniquely scary that we haven't seen before Mm -hmm. And Blumhouse would come back to this well too whenever they would do Unfriended, which would then lead to Host and things yeah. like searching. So, interesting. yeah, it worked better for me with things like on rewatch for it because I noticed it a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. The I remember watching it in theaters because I was I read about like the how they were going to incorporate the connect and that was going to be like their like pushing the oscillating fan like that being the big scare mm -hmm. and i just remember watching it in theaters and not really noticing anything i'm like and maybe i just didn't know what to look for so it really wasn't until rewatch and it actually does look pretty cool i think that where it also works is um moments that aren't necessarily supposed to be scary but end up being creepy just because really of the way unsettling. it looks yeah. yeah like when they show like Robbie and Wyatt like in close up with all the green dots on their face with the night vision yeah. like it looks really unsettling like that mm -hmm. actually is a really interesting look right there like visually it's just a little bit more interesting and i think that uh works where i what are you going to oh, say I, I, first? I also I also just think it's such a cool kind of subtextual thing. The fact that like those dots are there, mm -hmm. even if you can't see them, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like they're there and we, you can see it with this camera, but just the fact that like you're existing and playing these games and not realizing that all that is in the room with you, mm -hmm. like surrounding you. Like I find that unsettling from a technology standpoint, sure. just knowing that like, wait, that's how that works. And that's actually what's happening here. But you don't even under like realize that, and I think that that links into the idea of the demons and the mm -hmm. ghosts and the supernatural. I think that that mm -hmm. connects connects <laughs> really well on multiple levels, and especially these days. Like I think that there, yeah, there's cameras everywhere. There's algorithms. Everything you look up, everything is being tracked all the time, and it's easy to forget about it. But it's when it's called out in such a way. It it is very unnerving, yeah. just to know that that's happening. Ugh. Yeah, this it's series really does predict where we're kind of headed in our own film homes, and that everything is like you said, tracked, and every moment we do, like it's really hard to get away with anything at this mm -hmm. point. Like it's you know it's hard as a my, as a kid to get away with anything. Like I remember <laughs> once a couple years ago we grounded our daughter for a, an afternoon because she said she took the dog for a walk and we're like you didn't because we would have seen you go out with like the camera like we see everyone go in and out and there's yeah. no little kid and a little dog on a leash walking out and back in the home <laughs> kid and so you know like you lied uh no phone for an hour um like it's harder to get away with things because everything is tracked um, yeah. Where there was a little bit of a missed opportunity, there's like the moment where there's like Toby's avatar is on screen. And I think like Ben is like, what a creepy yeah. avatar. And it starts moving. And they're like, whoa, how are you doing that? And they never go back to it. And I think you could have done 
some really cool stuff with that. The other thing that jumped out with like the use of the Connect and Skype is how prevalent product placement is in this movie. Like, I don't know what the budget is overall. It's pretty low. It's a couple million, and I'm I'm pretty sure by the end of the day, probably everything was paid for by like Microsoft or um, Pop by Chips, Apple by Pop Chips by like, Pepsi. Pepsi. Because, like, they're so prominently placed, like, throughout this. Is it, it didn't feel super prominent to me, though. Like, it wasn't like, mm, I'm thirsty. I'm going to go grab a Pepsi, you know, <laughs> like like in Wayne's World or something. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't feel quite to that level. Well, that level. would be like, so it... egregious, though. Like, it would <laughs> yeah. have to be. Hey, or, like, I don't the know. Kool-Aid like, I've seen man episodes. would have to burst through the wall. <laughs> you know, or, like, if anybody's seen Bones and they're, like, driving this car and they're, like, Hey, what's this doing? They're like, oh yeah, I just got this new car. Have you seen this like cool like camera thing and this GPS? Like it's so horrendous sometimes how they hammer things in there. It, to me, it was like okay, there's a box in the background. Like he's eating some snacks. Like it, uh, it kind of made sense with the home setting. It didn't feel like I mean, too I kinda, offensive. I kind of forgive him because like again, these are like cheaper made films. This is also earlier in Blumhouse's you know time. Like hey, if they can get some extra money for putting a product in to like do it like then let's do it. But like you said, like they're not like drawing attention. Like, I mean, Madam Web, I think is one of the most egregious, most recent examples. It's actually hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, And what they do for the product (laughs) placement in that one. But in this one, it's just like, Oh yeah, it's like kind of casual. And, and it also like, um, like there's even moments that are able to like kind of cut some corners. Cause there's, um, there's a part where uh, Wyatt is in the bath and he's watching SpongeBob. And, but that's because Paramount owns SpongeBob. And oh, so it's mm-hmm. like okay. they were able to do that without them having to pay out of pocket for, you know, for that reference because mm-hmm. it's in house. So it was like, a you know, uh, I, I don't blame them for having it. And it makes sense in that house. They have name brand snacks. They're not buying, you yeah. know, Dr. Thunder. Dr. Pitt. Type Shasta. You know, they're <laughs> buying name brand snacks in that big old house oh, yeah. where they I mean, wear they... their shoes inside. The mom only owns one shirt. (laughs) That's what jumped out when I watched it yesterday. And maybe because I watched a lot of Seinfeld and I just watched the episode where Jerry dates the woman who always wears the black and white dress. And he is freaking out because he's like, what else does she? He's like trying to get to the bottom of whether she owns. But I'm like, does this mom only own that like one kind of like tight button up orange shirt? Like, so she seems Mm. to wear it in a lot of the scenes in this in this movie so you know maybe like the all of it went to the snack budget and they could not afford more than one shirt well, the, for costume. the snack budget and the chandelier budget i love the, <laughs> yeah, the little like yeah. small things of how rich they are like again they have three laptops in this home in 2012 like in 2012 everyone was still sharing my laptop and the mm-hmm. only reason i had one is because i was going to college yeah. you know mm-hmm. so it's like they have three laptops in this home yeah. yeah, a lot of screen time in this home. Yeah. Another precursor, right? Like mm-hmm. just <laughs> constant screens. Mm-hmm. Kid can't even take a bath without watching SpongeBob. Right. Like, really, just they really got to cut back on that. Yeah. All right, sorry, we got a little digress no, this there. Is, this is this is the good stuff. So, it, it, domestically, this movie did not perform as well as Paranormal Activity two or three. It debuted with 4.8 million in midnight showings, so that made it the third highest in midnight grosses for a horror film behind its predecessors, Paranormal Activity 3 and Paranormal Activity 2. It then grossed 15 million in its opening day, uh, which was also lower than the third and the second and third films. Uh, so it brought in a total of 29 million in its opening weekend. So kind of the same thing we saw with the Saw franchise, like it has a peak of doing really well, and then the numbers start to drop. Before the opening weekend, some analysts predicted that it would come out at number one, but still with a lesser gross than its predecessor, but that it would be number one. But the negative initial reviews, and it was also competing with Supernatural Horror Sinister, which was previously covered on uh, The Pond and the Pendulum, So the opening weekend gross was lower than the projected numbers, including Paramount's range of 35 to 40 million and analysts numbers of 40 to 42 million. 
So it didn't do as well as people thought or hoped is basically the long and short of that. Megan Colligan, who was the president of domestic distribution for Paramount, attributed the lower than expected numbers to a market saturation of sequels, plus the film's bigger focus on international marketing. So they, Paramount hit international marketing for this film harder than they previously had and harder than they did for domestic. Um, so she's like, yeah, they might be kind of sick of sequels, but also we push it harder in other countries. So um, it did do better than its predecessors in terms of international numbers. It opened in 24 countries with an opening weekend gross of $26 million, 11% higher than that of the third installment. There was a movie theater chain in the United Kingdom, Cineworld, which accidentally showed screenings of this film <laughs> instead of the DreamWorks animated film Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted, Leaving children traumatized. I remember that. That that's so funny. And then, um, because I think because didn't we like get that by accident like earlier this year with uh with Saw and Paw Patrol? Didn't yes. that like, did happen? that happen? I, I'm pretty sure it happened at least once. It probably <laughs> did. I think people went to either went to the wrong screening. Or oh, or maybe it was just that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe there was the mix up. Um, I mean that does happen. Like I went when I went to. Uh, I went to a movie on Tuesday night and someone had come on and said, hey, the wrong movie is showing like in the I mean, it happens. Right yeah. I mean, but like, how do you not a get up and tell the staff or mm -hmm. B take your child and leave? Why are right. you staying long enough for children to be traumatized? Like, it's like, wait a minute. Let's just see where this goes. I mean, to <laughs> it to be fair, like I think because like the opening of this movie, like is like the last couple minutes of Paranormal Activity 2 you can see where, like, you could be a little confused. Uh, yes. But if you are paying for an animated movie, you know, like, yeah. wait, the, like, you should jump out. Like, this isn't animated. What's going on here? Like, when I sat down for Evil Dead Rides and they started playing Flashdance, mm -hmm. some of us got up and told the staff, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they fixed it quite promptly. So um, this also has happened in the U.S. in 2007, Screening The Hills Have Eyes 2 instead of The Last Mimsy, which I'm not oh familiar with what The Last Mimsy is, but it's a movie for children, and they accidentally yeah. showed Hills Have Eyes 2. And then again in 2010 with screenings of Saw 3D instead of Megamind, and Saw 3D starts out really gnarly. Yes. Um, and then in 2015 with an accidental screening of Insidious Chapter 3 instead of Inside Out. That one so I that can one see I can how... see alphabetically mm -hmm. your scroll you know whatever you pick the wrong thing that one i understand yeah um, you know it's pretty funny i could see like someone thinking saw three and mega mind are connected because isn't mega mind about an evil genius i'm it not is. familiar i mean really isn't mega mind what is mega mind but like a saw movie in animated form scaled back for children just a hair i mean really that's what it is so <laughs> I just think it's funny that it's happened so many times. They're all with kids' movies too. Like yeah, it's never like, like horrible, some light drama. Scary stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's like the worst. Like someone always has a copy of like the Ser like a print of the Serbian film on hand, and it always. Oh, God. Yeah, it's like oh yeah, we made a mistake with that, and like Garfield three, Garfield <laughs> eats lasagna. You know, just <laughs> that, that that Garfield classic that we all love. Yes. So, like I mentioned, this was not well loved critically um, from Rotten Tomatoes. While it does, while it does manage to wring a few more screams out of the franchise's surprisingly durable premise, Paranormal Activity Four provides fans of the series with dismayingly diminishing returns. And I can see what they mean by that. We'll get into that yeah. when we talk about the movie. So it was released on DVD and Blu-ray in January 2013, and it grossed $9.8 in home sales. That's how I watched this mm -hmm. movie, was when I bought the box set and watched all the way through it. There was meant to be a post credit scene that teases the next movie, The Marked Ones, um, but it was taken out of the film when it was released on DVD. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much people actually saw of that. Dang. So it was like I a... Didn't see that. I didn't, I didn't see this one in theaters, so I never, yeah. so I never knew that did that. I saw it in theaters, but I didn't stick around for the credits. I know, like this was the start of the 
you know, Marvel doing the post credits, mm-hmm. but I don't yeah. think that that had become like a full on, like, do we expect it in every movie type of thing yet where you get that teaser. Um, honestly, like this is where I tapped out on the series, but it was really, to be honest, I wasn't on the part three episode. It was the end of part three is where I started to really like, okay, this is kind of run out of steam. Like when Dennis runs into the coven and I'm like, why is okay. he afraid of the Golden Girls? And he just like runs away in terror. <laughs> like that is when I'm like, why is he so afraid of them? They're so old. And he's that is when I kind of like that movie, like as good as part three is and the like ending ending is fantastic. Like that moment kind of like really brought me out of it. And part four didn't do anything it didn't have that Godfather three moment where I'm like, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. It's like, no, I yeah. think I'm out. I think I'm, well, I'm okay. Well, to be like the the film, to tease the marked ones, I think there's a moment that's going to bring you back in. Okay. Remember this moment okay. whenever we record next week. <laughs> okay. So I'm looking forward to watching the marked ones. It'll be a, the marked ones and Ghost Dimension. Like those two will be first time watches. And I, I really like Next of Kin. I really enjoyed I'm, that on first watch. I'm looking forward to your thoughts on the next one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Excellent. So, all right. Thank you, Ari. Actually, yeah. since all of you guys checked this out on, like, the Blu-ray box set, um, do they feel light in terms of features? Um, I mean, yeah. If it, if we're all – if it's all the same box set that we have, like the one that has the hand on the, on the side. I'm trying to uh, find it. I just um, have like a basic Blu-ray. It looks yeah, it's, it's just like one of those. Mine is yeah. very bare bones. Oh, it's a, I, yeah. I mean, I have the I have like the eight individual one. Oh, like, I don't have box that one. set, but even still, like it has each one has like the the two different versions of the film. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. and then it has even some more additional deleted scenes. Yeah. Um, on a few of them, but that's really about it. That's I don't it. even I don't even think there's commentary. Yeah, there's no commentary, and then, like, the deleted scenes tend to be more little character bits. Um, They're like the lost files. Yes, yeah. I found them a little bit. I found them a little less. I mean, but it was, like, a $12 for six film box set, so, I mean, why why am I complaining, I guess? Well, and and while we're here at this moment, I've been asking every episode, um, did everyone watch the extended cut for this one? Did anyone watch the streaming one? I watched both. I find it fascinating that this happens for every film, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of the times they make significant differences. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, I wonder why because when they're still released theatrical, there still are. So it's not like they're cutting mm-hmm. for you know like you know violence or anything. I can, but make I a guess, guess just to get the runtime under. Yeah, because it gets a tight under ninety. It's like an eighty three, eighty four minute movie. And to be honest, I watch both this week. Without, I don't remember, like five minutes after shutting this movie off, I forgot 80% of it. And I could not Mm -hmm. remember within like the three day window of like watching the extended and watching the theatrical, what the differences were. Like I could not for the life of me recall like what the big differences were in those 14 minutes. Um, If you watch it on HBO... They do have the extended versions of the films. You have to go into extras. And then you the extra oh. is the extended version. Oh. So I didn't just know for that. note. Yeah, I just on a whim looked at that yesterday. I wonder because I know sometimes they do that. And uh Oh, you're the, gonna have to like tweet that out. I don't think anybody sure. knows that. I've never yeah. even heard I didn't know you could do that. Yep. So oh. that's if you're streaming it on HBO. Uh Incredible. so fun fact. Um, I, so if you I do think, I mean, like you said, the time thing is a huge issue because there's moments where, you know, it's just the camera just mm-hmm. observing a room and not mm-hmm. always like something doesn't happen every yeah. time. And so it can really start to drag. Yep. And yeah, if you're not doing something, yeah. I think found footages very easily can wear on you yeah. or, or at least like make you check out. And that's mm-hmm. yep. not what you want to do, mm-hmm. especially if they're trying to, you know, if there's something really subtle in the background. You can only you can yeah. only play those cards so many times. And so extend it, making it longer is 
it's going to test your audience's patience mm. for sure. I mean, what I've noticed is because I've been like doing like the side by side after I watch it. There's a um a website movie movie hyphen censorship dot com that will like give you like the minutes breakdown and like mm-hmm. and where oh. things were cut and everything. It's a good so you can, like, site. Kind of see the differences. And what I've noticed on these ones, it's not like they're like like shaving time off of like lengthy scenes. They're just taking entire things out. Yeah. Like like hmm. whether it be a um uh in in the other one and like in two two cut like some of the scariest moments and i'm like that's kind of odd versus in this yeah. one i see what they're doing they they a lot of the stuff cut in this one is mainly at the beginning of the film and it's like more character stuff with the family but i think it was also kind of a mistake as far as um this film having its own identity which i know we'll get into but uh yeah so i just find it fascinating that each film has like a cut that is eight to ten minutes longer yeah I think part of it is like keep them under 90 minutes. You can probably squeeze in like an extra screening every day if you're a theater at that point and kind of like milk a little bit more out of it at that point as well. And also, like you said, uh, Rachel, keep the audience's attention Um, because there is like a lot of downtime in Mm -hmm. this one. Like rewatching it again yesterday, the chandelier scene when that occurred, I'm like, man, I thought this happened a lot later in the movie. And it wasn't that. It was just that the movie was, like, dragging a bit for me. And my uh-huh. my attention was already starting to kind of falter a little bit. But let's, let's talk about that. Let's kind of get into the movie itself at this point. Um, where do we want to start? Uh, I mean, I guess we can start on the the uh the kind of timeline and 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 that can like get into our like found footage e kind of stuff i think that's like a nice template to start with sure um so like this film i know mike you had been saying that like you were uh kind of you know at you know the point where it's like when does this stop and Mm -hmm. like i do agree with you that if they were going to do something different it should have been here Mm mm-hmm like i think the the first three films are a nice trilogy it's a tight story yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it's I think it's totally fine. And they could still go back into those events, but didn't have to be again, still centered on, you know, this kind of still centric story, especially when we kind of see the scope of this coven keep expanding. So that's why, again, the marked ones is an interesting one. Cause it's like if they would have done what they did in the marked ones here in the franchise, I think it would have kept people's interest a little bit more. And then maybe we still could have done this same movie, but afterwards. So that way it still feels like there's like more distance between them. Mm -hmm. Cause like, and also I wish they didn't open up this film with footage of Katie again. I know. Like, I I think it could have been its own thing if they just would have got straight into it. And especially like in the extended cut, like starting in with this like Halloween scene and like you get to like meet the family that way versus it going from, okay, hey, don't forget about Katie. Don't forget about the events of two. Like, they almost did a phantasm (laughs) where they're like, (laughs) here's some additional footage. Here's some footage you've seen already. And that's what you missed on, paranormal activity. Uh, It it felt very odd in its own way. And that's kind of my biggest qualm with this film in general is it doesn't have its own identity. It's kind of like a greatest hits from like we're seeing a lot. Yeah, we're seeing a Mm -hmm. lot of recurring things from all three films that came before, which with my editor toby theory that might be for reason but who knows but again this one just feels very it, it, it's not bad it's just like well we've seen most of this stuff before aside from the you know additional uh, slight additional stuff with like the technology we get so mm-hmm. like i just wish this film was because every other entry is like this is the this one this is the this one and then this is just the oh yeah this is the we're doing it again mm-hmm. movie yeah, I wish it had held some of its cards a little closer to its chest. Like, I, I hate that opening sequence because it just immediately tips you off like, oh, OK, this is this is directly tied to this. Mm-hmm. I wish it would have trusted the audiences a little bit more and had maybe that reveal happen just a little bit more organically, because by opening it that way, we're expecting it. We're mm-hmm. like, OK, how is this tie in? How does this tie in? It, it just and then you start predicting and it's not that hard necessarily to see where yeah. this is going, um, even if. I mean, we'll talk about the, the, the boys, even if you think it's one over the other, like you're still thinking like, it's okay, one of, one of these kids is Hunter. Right. It just immediately undercuts so much of it, I think. And I think that's a really 
big disservice because there is so many great things about I like this family unit. I like Catherine Newton's amazing. Like I, I, I like a lot of the things that they do here. And I feel like that is such a bummer that they kind of take away some of that by immediately letting you know where this fits into the rest of the franchise. Mm -hmm. You could, like if you held off the reveal that like Katie is involved until like that beginning of the third act when like the two boys run across the street, Yeah, that would have been like such a good little like shocking moment. But Mm -hmm. instead, like you said, like you get that 30 seconds into the movie and you're yeah, like, you already oh. know. Yeah. And you can, and then you can kind of predict exactly like it's going to go from here to here to here. And the only real surprise is that like Wyatt is a uh, hunter and it's not Robbie. And that's, but that's not enough of a surprise to be interesting. Yeah. If, if they would have fooled us into thinking that this wasn't connected and right. then just, mm-hmm. and then be like, no, it still is. Then I would have been like, okay, fine. We're still here in this storyline. And that's totally cool. Like that would have been a true Katie jump scare if we yeah. did not know. Mm-hmm. That would have been amazing. What were you say it, Aria? Um, just that I think like this whole story for four would work better if this wasn't a found footage movie. If they weren't trying to jam everything into found footage, yeah. I think the story would be smoother. I think like the reveals could be a little like feel a little bit more real. Mm -hmm. Like, and you know, I've said before, I'm a horrible found footage purist. And so like, I think if you can't make a found footage movie, that makes sense. Make a movie about found footage. Mm -hmm. Like they could still use found footage elements in this. If it was like a regular narrative movie, but the kids were reviewing you know, the spooky stuff starts to happen, so they start recording and we see the kids reviewing it. Um, because mm-hmm. there's so many times it's like we're zoomed out a level too much. Like, why are Alex and Ben recording themselves watching a recording? Yeah. That makes sense for Mika in the first film because of his, like, meta goals that he's talking about constantly. But it doesn't make sense for any reason for Alex and Ben here. And so I think, like, the story has its holes And I agree with you all that I think if they would have done the Katie reveal differently, that would have worked better. But I think I could, like, get behind this whole movie more if it wasn't trying to be found footage the whole time. Even if you went, like, if you want to, if you're like, well, that's the conceit of what we do and that's the series. Mm -hmm. If you went something like the Lake Mungo route, where it was more like a mockumentary. And you're like, well, we've recovered some of this footage. We're going to do dramatic reenactments. We're going to interview survivors. Mm -hmm. If you kind of went that route and did something like a little bit different with it. And again, it would feel fresh as well. It wouldn't be, Mm -hmm. okay, here's the formula. We're going here to here to here. Because like you had said, Devon, like this plays like the greatest hits. Like we have the Mm -hmm. bed sheet being pulled off. We have the person being pulled down the hallway. We have the kitchen scare. Now it's the knife going into the ceiling. And my thing to that is like, do people in these movies, like how tall are these ceilings where they never, like when you walk into your kitchen, you can see your ceiling. Like, it's not like it's like a hidden place. Like, it's not like you would, because that thing's up there a couple of days. Like you would notice that like you. It's it's a rich kitchen. It's a high ceiling. I mean, (laughs) I feel like the film even doesn't at times like know why it's being mm-hmm. a found footage film at yeah. the time because like again it's at this point it's just because it's necessary because yeah. e- even the film slips up that like at one point it says okay November 6th is night one but we've already been watching three days worth of mm-hmm. yeah. recordings beforehand so like why does that not count like day one of what like who's who is the one that made the decision that's like no this is day one not yeah. you know these previous days that we've been watching before you know so it's like again unless it's toby it doesn't kind of no. it kind of doesn't make sense i think toby editing is the only plausible explanation at this point like honestly because that's the only way to make any of this make sense it's toby's making his highlight reels he's a bad editor mm-hmm. Uh, yes, or he's just he's doing a, it for himself. I mean, he's a demon. He didn't have time to go to film school. <laughs> but like, again, like, because I saw you ask Mike, like, why? What is the goal? And like, what are these tapes being used for? 
and I don't think it's for recruitment because I Katie's out doing the recruitment. Mm-hmm. The the videos aren't doing it, but because demons are full of themselves, they it, like Toby is making these movies for him and to for his exploits, but like also in like traditional you know uh, religious horror and stuff like that demons are more powerful the more people know about them or almost like a freddy krueger thing so it's like these tapes do need to be floating around just so somebody randomly watches it and goes who's toby Mm -hmm. you know that so that's really he's making these movies for himself and yes he is not a great editor but even (laughs) again makes choices to set up scares in certain scenes when he's like cutting back and forth between the living room laptop and the kitchen laptop and i'm like bro like okay so like he is setting himself up and he's gloating toby's a diva we know this Mm -hmm. well i think what we've just introduced is another problem with the movie and in that like we're four movies in it is trying to tell one overarching story as opposed to being like a lot of individual stories which is fine like if you want to do that that's great um, was anybody like watching Lost? Like, did anybody watch Lost when it played out in real time? Okay. No. So I did. Like, and I, that was like I was one of those folks that got together with like a group of friends. We would watch that show every week. We'd have Lost parties, and what we found, like, by the time you get to like season six and season seven, and we know that it's kind of wrapping up, that things are winding down a bit. Yet the show was like still introducing new questions to the narrative um, Mm -hmm. but it's not answering any other questions and that's a lot of what this movie does is it's introducing a lot of new things like it's introducing this kid Robbie it's uh, introducing the fact that the coven has gone from like Blanche and uh, Mama (laughs) and and all of like the gold and Dorothy it's gone from them to like there's hundreds of women in this coven at this point so it's gotten like much larger in the interceding years it's introduced this idea that at some point Katie lost Hunter and has had to like find him again so none of these questions are answered like nothing is really answered in this movie and then you have this like really unsatisfying ending and Mm -hmm. i I made a mental note to bring up the devil inside which came out the same year as this movie because i think both movies have like similar endings although the devil inside is a bit more unsatisfying you gotta let your dog out no it's okay he's staring (laughs) at the door and it's a little bit creepy Oh, she just heard somebody. Okay. My husband's coming in. Okay. Just like, are you sure it's not Toby? I, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I'm um, not sure. <laughs> so, but like the devil inside at the end of that movie, there's a car wreck. And then it's like, go to this website for more information. It's like, but I want to see the end of a movie. I don't want to go to a website. And audiences yeah. were furious. And the end of this movie is pretty similar in that like, Alex is running around. She can't move Wyatt. And then you get demon face Katie. The camera drops and that's just it. And you're like, well, that's deeply unsatisfying. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a big problem with this movie is you have all these like pretty interesting questions that are introduced and none are answered. And I have like still like a half dozen questions from the other movies that haven't been answered. Like who's filming and why what are the tapes for why was the why were the tapes the only thing stolen in part the beginning of part three this that and the other thing mm-hmm. yeah once again and like by the end of this movie she's running with a laptop and we're like okay like what are what are we doing here and i guess the film just got to him was like we don't know either movie <laughs> over. you know that's what the end of the film felt like and it was just yeah. like mm. I, like I, I like i totally forgot I, while i was rewatching, i went Oh, like, okay, I guess. I mean, I kind of get it because, like, at this time, like, you couldn't do Skype, I don't think, like, on your phone. And, you know, she they do set it up. And it does feel authentic to me. Like, these kids would be talking all the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember a time when that was, Mm -hmm. like, very, like, that's what you did because you didn't have FaceTime necessarily. You didn't have the app on your phone to do that. So I wasn't so bothered that she was carrying it. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to go over to that house by myself. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Either that or I'd be like, come over here right now and go over there with me because 
I am not going over there by myself without somebody knowing what's going to happen. But didn't she just find like her his body in her closet? Oh yeah, that's true. I guess she couldn't call yeah. him, and I guess maybe the first time she went over there yeah. <laughs> to see what's going on. So yeah, it's just yeah, I, and I guess that leads to like the why are you filming of it all, and I think this is the movie that really stretches the conceit, right? Like Ariel, mm-hmm. I know you were saying that before. What are some of the things like as our resident like purist? What are the <laughs> things that you think like really break the conceit? Um, this family leaves their laptops open on mm. and in one place mm-hmm. for days. I don't <laughs> buy that because no. Ben sets up his little recording scheme to record these different rooms. And like Alex could agree to that for her bedroom. That makes sense. But like the family laptop that lives in the kitchen that mom uses for recipes is like she never takes that to the couch she never mm-hmm. shuts it when she's cooking something messy if you know like i don't nope. buy that strictly for recipes that yeah made me nothing laugh else so hard because <laughs> she's it, a mom he goes, so he goes, where do you keep it and she's like in the kitchen what does she use it for and it's just oh like my god so anything funny. yeah so uh that one doesn't work so well for me um and then the running across the street with the laptop like we talked about but also them recording like ben and alex recording themselves reviewing the footage there's not really a reason that they would do that yeah totally that takes me out of it a bit um recording the dance party with the connect dots that looks cool Mm -hmm. i could totally see why they would do that and be like look at how cool this looks um gotta record dracula you got to And when spooky things start happening, I'm like, of course they'd want to set up some kind of surveillance thing. But the how they do it, I don't quite buy. So Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, just like them recording themselves doing just like regular things, even when they're not in the house. And it's like, okay, well, so yeah, what do you uh, need then? But I guess, again, the only explanation I can have is if Toby is the one editing these films then like his demonic you know presence like uh does something to them that compels them to want to film it more yeah uh, is, I, is, is that like, I the buy. only way i can yeah. explain it yeah. because it's like at, like especially in this film there's really not a reason to be filming for like half of this film unless toby is making you do it mm-hmm. so that way he has his footage for later is toby corporeal like no. he must be because well, he has the outline with the dots Although he's, Toby. He's, and he's see, yeah, th- mm. th- that that goes into my Again. theory from last week about Toby spreading himself like Horcruxes, because Katie's <laughs> yeah. got a little Toby in her, Robbie's <laughs> got a little Toby in her, but okay. Toby is also a giant form that they talk to, and there's a scene where Robbie is looking one way, and then that tiny body is walking up behind him. So yeah. is that like the projection of uh, what? toby's gonna become when he takes one of these kids over like so there's like mini toby also see Uh, this is what's so frustrating like none of this like it none of it makes sense and like it's just yeah they just Mm -hmm. they they continue to build this franchise on like creepy imagery and ideas but give you nothing Mm -hmm. and so like that's fine maybe for one or two but eventually it's like I don't care. Like, what is happening? I don't. This no. makes no sense. I don't know. I, you, it's hard to get invested in the story because it doesn't feel like there is a story. Right. And I right. don't. I don't think this is like a Friday the Thirteenth situation where, like, they clearly don't. Like in the eighties, like they don't care that it doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like, it's like right. there's no real interconnectivity between the movies they're not trying to really make them connect it's like whatever the kids are going to turn out these are just yeah. like throwaway movies or it's or the texas chainsaw franchise which like none of it makes a lick of sense and if you try to think about it your brain you will actually feel your brain constrict and burst mm-hmm. i mean yeah. they're trying to is... make sense of it they want to tell yeah. one story that makes a lot of sense and you know i think we You know, when we talked about Saw, as difficult as it could be at times, as hard as it could be, and as, like, 
is so as the pretzel as barbarian as the pretzel logic was sometimes <laughs> at the end of the well, day now i want a pretzel oh my god i, I had a With warm mustard. so the other day i went to see love lies bleeding and instead of a milkshake i got the pickle spears and a mm. pretzel and a warm pretzel <laughs> and, heck, oh my yes. god it was so good oh that pretzel was good the pretzels made me thirsty though um yeah Again, I've been watching a lot of Seinfeld. Um, (laughs) You could still look at that franchise and you could like logic it out. Like it mostly makes sense. And I think they try to do that here. I think they use Saw as kind of the template. Like, let's tell one long story. But like it falls apart. Like after the third movie, it falls apart like very, very, very quickly. They yeah. just add more loose ends without ever tying up any of the older ones, I feel like. Yeah. So it's just mm-hmm. like, okay, okay. A, like, like yeah. it's, it's dependent on this old story that they started. But at the same time, they're mm-hmm. like not actually ever concluding any of that. Mm-hmm. So it's just spreading it out in such a weird way. I also, I wanted to ask you about the references because that really mm-hmm. bothers me. I feel Let's like this, this film is like really more referential than so many of the others almost like it couldn't come up with like its own unique identity and own unique scares so it's pulling all of these hit like the greatest hits Mm -hmm. from other movies and i think that is so obnoxious to be like oh this little kid's like danny torrens from like on his little tricycle running around the kitchen and we got the ball like the changeling heading down the stairs and what else did the the chair sliding from poltergeist yeah, the chair sliding from Poltergeist. I mean, the fridge doors, you know, yeah. a classic. The cat jumping up all the time. It's just like all of these very typical horror tropey things. And that feels so cheap to me. Yeah. Because it's like you can't even come up with your own things. It would be fine if it was one small thing here. Like, oh, did you catch that Easter egg? But I, here, I ultimately, I end up feeling like they couldn't come up with their own. Like, what are we going to do to make this film scary? I don't know. This worked for the changeling. Yeah. Let's do that. That's mm-hmm. creepy. Right. And so it's really frustrating for me and it's not, I don't know if they thought it was cool, but I don't, I don't think it's cool. Yeah. I definitely, I also get like annoyed when films like jam, like too many references in like uh, most recently I saw that new movie sting and there's mm-hmm. like a scene that has like five alien and predator references like back to back to back to back and it's Mm -hmm. like oh my goodness like okay we get it you know and like but i think especially i I, at the time that this film came out this was again like it was in that kind of that marvel era but there was a lot of comedies that were also becoming very self-referential and like meta and like doing Mm -hmm. stuff like this like this was like kind of hot at the time like i mean whether it be like you know comedies like easy a and 21 jump street before that were kind of doing it a lot so i, I feel like i guess this was yeah. the horror version of doing that like okay hey we're gonna do this but then also toby he's a bad film student oh. he's just like yeah hey, look i at, guess yeah look at maybe all the things i is. know like, <laughs> like i get it but it for a for a genre the subgenre that's supposed to be so progressive moving the needle forward adapting this cool technology Mm -hmm. like let's Mm -hmm. you know yes there's a supernatural element but we're going to present it in a unique modern fresh way it feels so regressive to go back to these very classic very tried and true tropes to like count on those for scares like it feels very just against the grain of what this franchise is and was and how it started and i yeah it's super annoying i think too this is really possibly where doing one every single year and not maybe having yeah. the time to map it out. And it, we said at the top, when we put this, you know, talking about the background, it doesn't sound like there was much of a master plan. Like, okay, at the end of part three, this is where we are. And this is where part four is going to lead to. Like mm-hmm. they didn't have something that was mapped out that was going to say what, here's what we're going to new do next with it. So what you have in mind is like at the end of part three, you have a date for a sequel in mind and you have a target like we have to hit this weekend in October uh, in order to like we have that projected into our budget. We're predicting making 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So we have to make a target and it's no longer like an artist choice. It's about making your financials and You've got like Juiced or Houston Schuster who, you know, have just like 
Paranormal Activity three is like their first real like narrative movie, right? Like mm-hmm. Catfish is a Catfish is a documentary, right? You yes. guys talked about that in the other episode, how mm-hmm. there are some narrative elements to it, but it's really a documentary. Um, they've just done their first narrative feature. They maybe emptied out all the bullets in the chamber. And now they're told, mm. like, okay, now yeah. you're going right back on set. And they're like, we don't really have anything. Yeah. I yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think it's interesting because this film it feels like i don't know it almost feels like this was like a like uh, they were under contract to make a sequel and they just like kind mm-hmm. of took what they could and did it because like it just feels a little bit lazy cuz you can be like even echoing the things from your previous films in an effective way i mean again we mentioned evil dead like you know you know every evil dead movie's going to have somebody's arm get cut off mm-hmm. you know you know mm-hmm. somebody's going to be in some sort of cellar at some point like you know these things are going to be there, but the creativity that they use to pull that off is, you know, they put so much more thought behind it versus in this one. It's just like, oh, hey, you you love a leg pull. We're going to do it again, <laughs> except it's a person this time. Aha, we got you. Mm-hmm. Or like, <laughs> you know, like doing, again, like some of these similar things. And and it's like, again, Toby, I get it. You, you like your moves. You like <laughs> to stick to the playbook. But, like, you got to give me something else. No. Yeah. And I guess that leads to a question like, what is Katie? Right? And it leads to like, you're, we're talking about maybe Toby's the person editing. So Katie's reintroduced. She is kind of in and out of this movie. Like, she shows up when you need her to show up for the last 10 minutes of the movie. Because, like, okay, nothing's happened for, like, 70 minutes. Now we have to wrap things up. So she needs to... Sh- and I'll admit, like, it is spooky like when she shows up in the connect dots and stands up like that's a pretty yeah cool that's little creepy moment. It, that yeah is it is very pretty creepy. neat um, where does she go when she goes to like to the hospital does she, she does she actually go to the hospital why was she injured i don't is this something to do with again the that's demon? a great like, I don't question understand. and that's one of those things where like because you've introduced her into the movie you're asking that question like where what's going on with her as opposed to just following the narrative of the movie mm-hmm. like you have her in the back of your brain wondering when she's going to come back in rather than just like focusing on the story as it's well and especially like before we know like the hunter thing like it makes sense i guess on the first watch to think that like oh maybe he did something to mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. but then as the story progresses it's like wait what yeah that doesn't make any sense like where did she go yeah. why is she gone mm-hmm. Because there are cop cars, there are ant- like there's. Yeah. It's not like he's just somebody's telling them what happened. Like, oh yeah, she's in the yeah. hospital, and you never actually know that. It, so it's like, well, there's some sort of emergency services yeah. there. So I would imagine something did actually happen. So, but what and why? I don't know. It, it makes you no wonder, sense. like, is, is she always possessed? Is she ever able to fight the possession? Um, yeah, maybe there... she tried to do something to herself mm-hmm. because of like the demon. But see, great questions that never are... <laughs> a lot, <laughs> lot of questions. I definitely because the the film's whole conceit falls apart when you are thinking about like why is Katie doing the things that she's doing? Um, because how did she lose Hunter to the foster system to begin yeah. with? Yeah, yep. To yes. then now she assumedly had to go off and go do this again and steal somebody else's child. But Toby doesn't want Robbie. He wants Hunter. So she, I guess, got another kid. So that way she can do this, like, weird switcheroo There's that she's so attempting to do. There's, it, it doesn't like, make sense. And I love a, Katie. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I appreciate how much she actually is in this franchise. And it's like, oh, yeah, she's like our she's our, our spooky boogie woman mm-hmm. uh, in, a, in a way. And I, I love that for her. But, uh, but at the same time, yeah, like if you're just having her there just because for this reason rather than having something interesting to do because, yeah, it, it, like what did she do? How did she lose Hunter after she stole Hunter? How? how? We don't know. No clue. Unless she abandoned him somewhere, but then to what end? Like... So maybe she gains because so I did have a theory that somebody pointed out that was like, does she at certain point gain moments where she's not possessed? Right. Like, she, because I guess. Again, yeah. If Toby spread out all, all over the place. I don't know if he could keep the control over her all the time. So maybe at like a point of lucidity, she put Hunter in the foster care is like, mm-hmm. you need to be away maybe. from me. But I want you to have a better life or something. Right. 
maybe she did it yeah. in that, but then when she gets repossessed, oh, no, no, go get me another boy. Um, you know, so who, but again, like, I, I'm not sure. Not not exactly sure. No. You know what I think, Katie? Katie is like your friend from high school who you didn't hear from for a long time, but then she gets really into an MLM and she hits you up years later on social media like, hey, girly, I've got a business opportunity for you. And like, that's her coven. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think this is all a metaphor for MLMs. Excellent. I, I like that take more than... <laughs> What we see in this movie because I have no idea what's happening. I have no idea what they're saying. I have no idea what's going on. Can we Ugh. talk about a couple things that I do like? Yeah. Yes. All right. I want to talk about Robbie because uh-huh. I think Bradley Allen is so wonderfully weird and creepy. So creepy. So creepy. And Such a good creepy kid. Yeah. 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 In, in the best possible way. Um, his introduction is weird. Like it does that thing where like. You know, the, unless like it's right in front of me with the camera, like I have no idea it's there, which I don't really like. But like he does such a good job of being like a great 85 year old, five year old kid. <laughs> yes. Right? He's yeah. so like yeah. formal and stiff and the expression on his face and you don't know anything about him. Um, and then it he just drops out of the movie at the end of the second act and you never hear from him again. Like you never see him again. You don't know anything about his backstory. I guess you imagine because you have all of those like, you know, members of the coven, you must figure Robbie must be like the son of one of those women. I mean, that probably makes the most logical sense in that. Or maybe he had a Benjamin buttons disease. And he, that's why he acts like an 85-year-old. And maybe yeah. he was one of their husbands. And that's why oh, he gross. has a 100-year-old fork. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah, he what? got Benjamin buttoned. What's with the fork? That, See, that, made, just... that scene cracked me up mm-hmm. so much. He has a ship shuba and a special fork that tells the future, which I thought was mm-hmm. going to be a Toby thing. That goes nowhere. We goes don't nowhere. Have, we don't have a psychic fork in this movie, which yeah. I'm disappointed by. <laughs> and he's, he's just a you know, weird kid. Yeah. And like some kids are like that. Like I, cause I work around mm-hmm. little kids and some of them are just like that unsettling. Like you just get that vibe from them where you're like, and the funny thing about the kid who plays Robbie here is like the, there was this. So when my daughter was born, like she was born in the same hospital in the same day as this other kid. And my wife befriended the woman who gave birth to this other person because, you know, our kids are born the same day. And this other woman's daughter, you know, my daughter and that kid would, you know, growing up, hang out every now and again because, you know, the mothers are friends. Like, Robbie looks so much like this little girl. Like, they have the same kind of, like, facial structure. Oh, no. So it looks like this other kid that my daughter is kind of sort of friends with. Um, you know, at that age, it's really spooky. Um and just his line delivery is great. Like, it's mm-hmm. absolutely it is. like the way he's able to fuck with Ben, where he's like, he doesn't, you know, like he's like, he doesn't like you. And he's like, who doesn't like me? He's like, you'll find out. And it's just mm-hmm. like perfect. It's like mm-hmm. really, really funny, but also like really foreboding. Like you like you, he delivers that line and you can't help but laugh. But also you're like, OK, unlike Paranormal Activity 2, where the boyfriend gets away unscathed like things are going to go horribly horribly wrong for ben Mm -hmm. in this movie like ben the himbo is just gonna have like nothing good is gonna happen to him here in this movie i do like the relationship between him and Catherine newton's i can't remember her name Mm -hmm. (laughs) like actual characters alex but alex like i do really like that relationship i find it to be really sweet and very like authentic i guess Mm -hmm. for like that kind of age where it's like innocent but there are times when they're talking like they're older Mm -hmm. but they're also like best friends but they're kind of dating like whatever that means Mm -hmm. at this age right and i i can see that being like to me that is what like that's one very redeeming quality about this film is and i think it makes sense that Catherine Newton would go on to become one of our like young modern scream queens Mm -hmm. right like you can see that she's talented and just made for this genre in this film which so I I love seeing that and yeah without them I don't know (laughs) 
I don't yeah. know how I'd feel about his family and the the new people that we're meeting in the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's she's very fun. Uh, she's uh, very similar to uh, Allie and two. Uh, you could in many swap ways. them out. Yeah, I think they. Yeah, I think they're both on pretty similar levels. Mm-hmm. I like them both pretty equally. Um, uh, uh, ben gets a lot more to do than um, whatever Allie's boyfriend was in, in two. I forget his name. Hansy Hansy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, they're, yeah, very interesting kind of relationship of like, yeah, like, uh, you know, friends, but they kind of have a crush on each other. Um, but then also like uh, his character just like continuously just like breaks into their house and just like shows up and he's mm-hmm. just inside already. <laughs> yeah but that like that feels real to me like that no, was how it, it was for me in high school like friend like they would just literally just like come over and like hey yeah. and just like walk into oh, my house i definitely had like, that yeah. with certain friends too but yeah. the parents at least knew and it was like because they told me i could do that like he the first time he shows up the dad goes did you how are you in my house there's this something i mean i love this kind of false sense of security that we have in this house and i think that that's part of it like like the like the security system and like there's so many times when it's like you would think that you would be safe here in this house Mm -hmm. and they have all the things all the things that like money can buy right but it's not able to keep keep them out it's not even able to keep you know their kid's friend out let alone a supernatural demonic mom and dad are like routinely out at like one in the morning on random nights like that's how with like a fairly like two young kids at home like they're not only watch like they feel pretty comfortable letting like their 15 year old daughter watch two kids that are six years old like that's how one of whom they don't know like that's so weird i'm sorry like i don't some brand new neighbor moves in across the street and they get hurt and some random neighbor takes them in. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's some child protective services issues here. Like oh, yeah. that's yeah. not how that would work where they're just like, Hey, can you watch this kid? Right. Like yeah. we don't know you and mom doesn't know you. And what? No, Mm-mm. no, no, no. That's mom would hold like a bake works. sale for the kid, but like that they're not taking them in. Like, no, absolutely. No, that's so weird. Absolutely. Under no circumstances. I mean, there had been times at my job where like, I think there was a something that happened last year where myself and another teacher were like, "Hey, we will f- if if need be, we'll like we'll find a bed for this kid. Like they can crash at our yes. place." But we knew the kid, um, yes. and it was also one of those things where we're like, "Please don't say yes." Like, okay, absolutely. <laughs> it would have been like, "Oh crap!" Now we have to do it. We would have, but like, yeah. Um, well, and a teacher cops- makes a little bit more sense to me. Yes, than a know. random neighbor like. When it, this kid know. just shows up in the treehouse. Yes. Yeah. The, 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 like the cops or the paramedic, they wouldn't just be like, sure, she take this know. kid. Like that's no. <laughs> Although he was like, maybe they thought he was 40 years old and just a little person because <laughs> he was so formal. The, the yeah, mom got maybe. the mom got a simple favored, but without the sex. Like that's unfair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Maybe the sex is what put her in the hospital. Oh boy! Wow. Um, yeah, Catherine. I also you, well, oh, Catherine, sorry. Okay, you first. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say I really liked the garage scene. Mm-hmm. Yes, I thought that was very tense. I thought mm-hmm. Alex is really smart in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't. I was like, is she gonna make it out? Is she gonna die in there? Like, I thought that was really, really good. Yes. Is that like the the most like action centric scene that we've like gotten in one of these films? Because like everything is, you know, very subtle. Like we've had a few, mm-hmm. you know, aside from people getting dragged around. Like I thought this was like a more uh, kinetic scene, which was great. It was yeah. like, oh, finally, because like that's like what the rest of the film is missing. Like all the scares like, yeah, we got some good imagery, but there's no tension behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. think that's, again, just because of its, you know, lack of sticking to found footage motivation. But like. Again, like, yeah, I, I like that. It's like, okay, well, let's do something we, like, really haven't gotten to do in this yeah. series. We got a little bit more money. We can destroy a garage door. We got mm-hmm. that, you know, and that's and that's great. I really love that scene. And, like, in that's, like, my favorite um, uh, Catherine Newton of her, like, performances. Like, when she's, like, trying to explain it to the parents and she's, like, you know, dead ass is what happened. And her dad is just, like, so, like, unfazed by it. Yeah. It's just, like, kind of... It's kind of weird because, like, I think there's, like, almost an intentional lack of depth to the parents. Yeah. Like, to where it's, like, it's almost uncanny how, like, just the dad, oh, no, that's a cool effect you did there. And, like, just, like, the way he, like, kind of ignores uh, and is able to explain away, like, 
everything and talk her away and like so in that moment after that when she's explaining it you see yeah. the sheer terror of just confusion that she has and the fact that her dad is just like has nothing for her in that moment yeah. it's just like uh very upsetting i well, thought well, the mom oh sorry go ahead no, go ahead Ari. oh no um i thought the mom was going to end up being a part of the coven oh Ooh. i was surprised oh, that, see, that she wasn't been cool See, that would have been cool. And that would have explained why she took Robbie in. And that yep. would have, ex- like, oh that God, would yes. have explained so many things. Like, it would have, they could have set up, she could have injured them. Oh, see, that was a brilliant idea. So, why it, didn't they think of that? And again, it's like we were talking about, like, we like Catherine Newton in this. And I think she is great and believable in this. Like, she's a really mm-hmm. good final girl. I do think you could have put her in part two and Ali in part four. And you would have had kind of the same kind of character and result. Like, they're both, like, sweet nice kids that look after their younger siblings and are Mm -hmm. like really curious about the world and are very smart and intuitive and very resourceful so they're kind of the same character um but they're both like fine but i think the to what made part two interesting is that like the events were kind of centered on the baby right like the Mm -hmm. baby was in constant danger and that made it kind of interesting and also like the dog like the dog was also at the center of it so your heart is going out yeah because like Mm -hmm. you know like if you put a dog in danger and you put a baby in danger like i'm going to be immediately invested in part three you have katie and christy at the heart of it and like these two young girls are being attacked over and over again and you have like dennis the stepfather being the one who's curious about and he's the one that is doing his most to protect them and that is like a much different dynamic than you would typically see so it's because it's so different from what you normally see in a a horror movie it's like okay i'm in because i haven't seen something like this what you're getting here is like your typical you know teenage final girl like blonde final girl who is at the center of the getting the person getting attacked because like all the events that happen throughout it, she seems to be the one that is under like the chandelier almost kills her. She's Mm -hmm. the one that gets lifted on the bed. She's the one that gets almost killed by the car. All of these things center on her. And then you have the two parents that are oblivious. Like these are just things that I've seen in hundreds of other genre films already so i'm not Mm -hmm. really seeing anything new Mm -hmm. um i even unless you're doing it really really well my interest is going to be down half a peg not that you can't do it well and it's not that it's poor but it's just like it's just not going to be as compelling to me especially when it's four movies in Mm -hmm. um can we talk about the parents a little bit like you know you mentioned it Devon, how like the dad seems like oblivious because, you know, one of the things about this movie is like you're watching this marriage break up. Like part of the reason why mom and dad seem so oblivious is because they're really tied up in their own domestic drama. And it's not like the first movie where like Mika is an out and out like abusive partner in the second right. movie where like Dan is just the worst. This is just like two persons who have kind of fallen out of love with one another. They're no longer getting along. Uh, Doug, the husband is like sleeping on the couch more often than not. They don't really know how to communicate. Like at one point in the movie, movie Alex even makes a point to say, can we talk about what's going on here? And she's like, talking about like the events in the home like the spooky spooky things but that's really a metaphor for like the fact that this family no longer talks to one another and they're just sweeping everything under the rug and i just wondered what y'all made of kind of like watching you know mom and dad break apart from the early scenes in the movie as well i mean i feel like it was i feel like it was pointed and it was like and it was effective i just feel like it didn't tie into the paranormal activities happening and Mm -hmm. you know toby being there like because i think there is something uh interesting there of like um i forget what i know there's like a term that people use for it but like when you feel like you know your marriage is falling apart so you your solution is hey let's have a baby um Uh, instead mm -hmm. it's here it's oh hey let's take in this kid from across the street you know like they could have tied that in more and like 
but it's like you don't really i don't think the dad interacts with robbie like ever you know like there's like kind of like you know like the mom and the mom just like only interacts with robbie when wyatt is there Mm -hmm. you know so it's like they could have did something with that with like you know that you know uh either bringing the parents closer together or pushing them even further apart um they could have they could have did something with that um but you know again i feel like i guess like the just the ambivalence is like kind of part of it and and uh alex feeling like she's the one that is like kind of having to hold it together like uh there's a really great scene like early on whenever they like start fighting and she like distracts wyatt and she's like hey let's come over here and let me show you how to do a cartwheel or like whatever like i remember doing that for my siblings so it's like they they could have you know you know actually did something with it but again it just like kind of feels like they were just going, okay, uh, what domestic issue can we put in this movie? You know, and they just, like, kind of put it there, but then don't really actually engage with it. I, I do think that it's, there is, it can be tied into that, like, false sense of security mm-hmm. thing, which I think is something that they were probably trying to intend to put in there as, like, kind of an undercurrent thematic thing. And I think that that's also one because your parents are supposed to, you know, be supportive and be be there for you and be a sense of security and help you and protect you and i think that they're just like you said continuously pushing things under the rug and they're not offering that to her so i i do think it ties in there but i don't think it was executed very well it's like yes all the pieces are there but you needed to do Do a little bit more with it to actually make it mean something Mm -hmm. other than just come across as like shitty parents from 80s slasher movies right that are just like not present while all these kids are getting murdered like maybe that's a reference i don't necessarily think it was intentional i think maybe they were trying to have some other sort of conversation but kind of like the conversations here it's just bad communication nobody's really listening Mm -hmm. nobody's believing anything or even like taking it in like when they're having the conversation about the chandelier yeah like yeah maybe it's not the best time while dad's on the phone trying to get it fixed but like they don't even respond to her she when she's trying to explain exactly what happened they they really just it's like they have to work really hard to push it away Mm -hmm. And, and again this goes into like why is she filming this if like because there's like one scene where she shows her dad like one of the things that he thinks it's like one of their films or something but as things progress they are as evidence to where like hey show them the video of robbie yeah, getting yeah, in your bed point. show them the video of them going across the street doing this like you have this but yet there's not a point where she like you know like you know truly confronts them as like hey you guys need to sit down and you need to watch this so it's yeah. like yeah then she would be justified as to why we're still recording all this so it's like Mm -hmm. we don't really get that moment to actually use the reason that the footage is being filmed there's like a thing at one point it's not a scene that we see and again it's a lot of like show don't tell like we hear alex tell ben oh i asked mom and dad about why it's family like where we got him Mm -hmm. from who was because like there's like a comment that katie makes it looks like his mom so I asked, you know, about his birth parents and they both got really mad and started yelling and why it got upset. And now, like, my dad is the only one. And that should have been like that could have been a really big scene like that could have been mm-hmm. a pretty big moment. But in, what you do is you get it relayed through the uh, mouth of a 15 year old through like a chat device. So mm-hmm. you're not getting it. You're telling us what happened. You're not really showing us what happened. And that's kind of boring. Um, yeah. That could have been like a really powerful moment, especially for this family. You kind of come away not really no, you're not interested in this family at all. And, and, and that's especially coming off the third movie where, mm-hmm. you know, like, I think everybody likes Dennis, right? Like, Dennis is, like, someone that's really invested and cares. Like, I really love Julie. Like, Rest in Dennis. peace, sweet prince. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you you really dug them, and you like Dennis's friend, who was, like, the bass player yeah. for the Strokes, and <laughs> just, like, all those things. Like, you have this really dynamic cast of characters, and then you go from that to something that feels a bit more bland, uh, and it's not even like part two where you're like, man, I can't wait for like Daniel to get his because he's such a prick. It's more, you know, dad is just completely 
he's just checked out. Like he's just basically mm-hmm. waiting to get served the divorce papers at this point. So he can move in next to like Milhouse's dad and get his like race car <laughs> bed at the, at the, uh, bachelor apartments. Uh, I'll say I was disappointed that Toby had the opportunity to get each of these parents with his floating knife in the air mm-hmm. and missed on both of them. That was, yep. that was, an, that was so annoying. <laughs> yeah. So apparently, well, Sadly, like Stephen Dunham, who played the dad, like passed away before this movie mm-hmm. came out. Like he died from a heart attack at 48, like in September it was 2012. Yeah. Oh, oh, my God. And he was married to Alexandra Lee, who played Holly, his wife in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were like a real life married couple. Um, so you think you could kind of like maybe tap into a little bit of like any real tension that they may have had. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they were like the world's happiest couple. Um, yeah. I think it's just, more the script's fault than it's their fault. Possibly. You know? Yeah. Uh, Cause I just don't think they really got as many opportunities no. to really get to do that. And she had nothing to do in this movie. Like the mom has like literally nothing to do but cut veggies, but yeah. cut those veggies bell peppers so much, and wear that orange shirt. Um, do you think it she's making made... those bell peppers for like the soccer game? Like, I'm not bringing orange slices; I'm bringing bell peppers. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of vitamins we were hearing on mm-hmm. her little YouTube video. Uh, it would have made so much more sense if she had been in the coven. It would have. It just yeah. would have pulled so many things together. Or if she was an ex-member and they found her. Something. Yeah. Yeah, like she ran off Mm -hmm. with Hunter because she didn't want to protect him. Literally anything. (laughs) That could have been crazy. And because I, and it would have been interesting too because there's a noticeable difference that like, you know, I think Katie has been out recruiting because when we see the coven, not only are they like 70 deep, but these are like now like middle-aged uh, moms and women, getting younger uh, versus the, the elderly ones. So it's like, oh yeah, this is a new crop now, you know, so huh? they could they have, yeah, the, 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 the MILFs, the, the witch MILFs. Selling their so. crystals and their essential oils. Like, if Dennis ran into that at the end of part three, that would have made a lot more sense. Cause that is, you see like a hundred people come at you. It's like that old, like how many kindergartners do you think you could beat up? Like if you were in a gym full of kindergartners, how many could you take before they take you down? And I'm probably somewhere in the twenties before I would get wow. overwhelmed, Gosh. you know, 20 Robbie's. Right, it's 20 Robbies, you could do it. Like, I feel like Dennis could have taken those four. I mean, I know I wasn't on part three, so I didn't. There's like just three or four old women. I feel like he could have like done like he probably watched some Chuck Norris movies. Like he could have busted <laughs> out a couple moves, you know, I don't know. I, I'm really stuck on that. It, it's yeah. sticking in my craw. Um, but the thing with like the mom, like at the end of the like right before her like big death scene, She's like all of a sudden frightened and there's been nothing in the movie to that point where she thinks anything is going on in the house. It doesn't feel earned. It's just like, Mm -mm. oh, it's that time. We have to like wrap things up right now. Um, So and again, just like same thing we've seen in a couple movies where it's like, let's pick her up and drop her and that'll be the end of it. Doesn't even seem like it would do her in. No, it would hurt. Yeah, she'd have some issues some yeah. injuries but not necessarily like guaranteed to no. be dead no hmm. it's not hmm. like the dennis spine bend Ooh. where you're like no. yeah. that, that's gonna do some damage yeah See, it's like toby peaked right there and then yeah mm-hmm. it, you know we, we can only he, he could only go down from there because yeah we'll go back to the next snap and it's like okay yeah i guess that's katie's thing whatever um, you know, but yeah, the, the mom going out, it's just like, if we're doing this knife gag, it should have just like mm-hmm. literally just like fallen right in her back. Okay. And I would have been like, boom, got it. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Check off his knife. You have like, seriously, do something with it. You've shown it. Yeah. Use it. <laughs> yep. And again, it's just similar to like part two, there's a kitchen scare part mm-hmm. three, there's a kitchen scare. So we have to do another kitchen scare in this movie. And this is what we came up with this time. Um, yeah. Do we have anything else? Is there anything we're missing here? 
I mean, yeah, because, I mean, there's literally nothing in the finale. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, I guess we did cover, unfortunately. I will say, there, there was an opportunity missed. Um, they find, they could have finally name-dropped the, the title of this series. Because there's a part where Ben's talking, he goes, uh, they're talking about Robbie. And he goes, ever since he got here, weird shit has been happening. Mm-hmm. And all he had to say was, like, dot, dot, dot like some paranormal activity. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they yeah. had the opportunity there and they missed it. Yeah. That's that's this entire movie is that scene right there where they could have name dropped themselves because you might as well because this kind of feels like almost like the fan film version mm-hmm. of a yeah. paranormal activity movie. Oh. Yeah. I think though that the next discussion of the marked ones we're going to be back on track. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited oh, yeah. to watch that. I have not seen that one, so I'm excited to sit down with that one later tonight and start my watch. And I've heard very good things about it. I, I agree that it this this one is what like marked ones should have been in this place. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. they should like, have they should have them. done that. They should have done that here. Um, it 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 would need, this franchise needed the energy that marked ones going to bring. Whether or not all of it works, I don't know. I'm going to listen to the app. But it, it needed that kind of leap. It needed that kind of, like, it needed to do something that felt fresh, a little ballsy. Okay, we're doing something new. And unfortunately, I don't feel like this actually does. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I mean, for me personally, like, watching it out of context, like, if I just was watching this, it's fine. But I think mm-hmm. especially when you're watching them, like if you're marathoning them, by this point, I get tired. Yeah. Like it feels like, okay, like I, I, I don't want to do this again. So, I mean, overall, if I'm looking at this one as like a singular event, like I don't mind it that much. Mm-hmm. It's fine. There's it's things fine. I do like about it. I do have some issues, but it's okay. Not a total disaster. But there's just, like you said, missed opportunities. Mm-hmm. They had all the opportunities to name <laughs> name drop themselves and that really does sum up this entire movie it's just like could have gone so many ways yeah. and unfortunately it sounds like they just didn't go any way they just played it safe and hung out in the middle well yeah. said yeah i just think with the first three movies you have like a really tight story it's really clean it feels like and they even do like a godfather version of it i guess there's a version of it where you can watch the three movies in chronological order, mm. but they kind of cut it all together so you can watch it. So it's basically three, two, one almost in some ways. Um, so they kind of do what they do with like the Godfather part one and two, which shows in cable sometimes where they show that movie in chronological order. Mm. And you have like one nice, tight, neat story. It wraps up and you kind of like, it answers enough of, you know, it answers enough at the end of the day. You kind of get enough there. This kind of comes in, it introduces some things and then has no intention of answering it. And it doesn't really do it that well. And it kind of like reminds you of things you like about the other movies, but not in a way that feels fresh or refreshing. It's more frustrating than anything yeah. else. You do get a nice performance from Catherine Newton. You get, Mm -hmm. I think, like a really great. We, uh, Devon, you talked about the baby in part two, giving an all-time great child performance. I think Bradley Allen is the real MVP here. Like, I could just watch more of that kid on screen because he was like so hilariously creepy. Like everything he does is fantastic. Just his hangdog face. Just like he'll sit down and (laughs) oh, he's like watch your mouth like yelling at yeah. um ben yes. when ben starts cursing it's like i love this little old man just put him in some suspenders and a little hat and <laughs> put him in the next children of the corn movie. oh my god <laughs> oh. that would be so wonderful um and i get it and i like that you get like you know um Catherine newton was like 15 years old when she made this movie like she looks the part like you get age appropriate parts um it just, like, I think set the series back. And it sets it back pretty early. Like, part four is usually, you know, like, I think, like, the final chapter in The Dream Master. In Halloween 4, you usually get, like, some great part fours in a franchise. And 
unfortunately, Saw, well, no, Saw 4 was not one of the great entries. I like Saw 4. Wait, Saw 3. Saw, Saw 5 is a good one. Saw 4 That's the one with good. Rig. You're right. You know, you're, I'm wrong. Saw 5 is where it kind of goes downhill. You're right. My bad. Saw 4 is pretty terrific. Um, Saw 5 is where it kind of goes downhill a bit. Um, yeah, that was just my cat. Final Destination 4 is what I'm thinking of. That's the one that's not that Oof, great. That one, Scream yeah. 4 oh, is yeah. mm-hmm. one of the better entries. So, unfortunately, Final Destination 4 did not... I mean, it's actually rocky. a very great comparison because, like, Final Destination 4, it's still very watchable, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's just, like, also, like, okay, some things don't make sense here. We're repeating stuff. Like, it, that's mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. a great comparison. Yeah. Well, on that note, let's plug some stuff. Ariel, sadly, Ghoul's Magazine is no longer. It's yep. shuttered its doors. But you have a book coming out. Yep. And some stuff to plug. So yeah. it's coming up in higher REL. Yeah. Uh, because Ghoul's Magazine closed, I am looking for a new home at which to do admin support. So if you have a horror website and you need an admin, maybe hit me up. I don't know. I'm pretty good at it. Most importantly, um, you can pre-order my book, Millennial Nasties, which uh, analyzes 2000s horror. And that's coming out September 17th through Encyclopocalypse Pub. You can pre-order hardcover paperback ebook or audiobook anywhere in the world so international friends you can get physical copies too if you want to um and yeah thanks to rachel who just posted an interview with me that was very nice and so i would say that's the main thing to look out for if you follow me on my socials i'll be posting about it a whole bunch and you can find me at ari underscore hellraiser on Instagram and Twitter, and Ari Hellraiser, uh, Blue Sky. Excellent. September 17th, right? Yes. Excellent. Did you hear back from Travis yet? I'll cut this part out. No, I haven't. Okay. Hopefully you will soon. Just Hopefully. stay on top of them. It's still a ways to go. So. Yep. Rachel, what is going on with Halloweenies? I heard the Alien 3 episode nearly broke everybody with the recording length (laughs) yes yeah alien 3 we just completed well recording episodes are still dropping yeah we talked for we did it in three separate sittings but yeah nine hours total on alien 3 so no stones unturned crazy to think that there's actually i was thinking i was like oh we could have talked more about that which is wild to say um so yeah halloween is making our way through the alien franchise and Halloween resurrection will be coming up next. So should be a little, little more fun as from here on Wait, out. What? Um, yeah. You said Halloween resurrection. Alien. Okay. I misheard. Resurrection. Did I say Halloween? Resurrection? Maybe I misheard. Maybe I did. Halloweenies. No, alien resurrection up next. Um, and then, you know, the brilliance of alien versus predator films. So lots of fun stuff going over on the Halloweenies feed. And then, yeah, you can check out my interview with Ari over on these things matter. It's great. I love getting to talk, pick her brain about this decade of films that she writes about. And, um, yeah, you can follow me on the socials. I'll share everything else there. Um, uh, at the vinyl girl, G R R R L. Where are you on the Romulus trailer? I mean, I'm excited. I w- it looked great to me. I love Fede Alvarez and really like have enjoyed everything he's done. So I'm hope you know, um, optimistic mm-hmm. and trying to keep my excitement in check because that usually screws me over if I get too hyped. But I was happy with the trailer, and he has talked very openly about being against a lot of spoilers in trailers and against showing too much so i'm hoping that stays true because i don't want to see i just want to go in and i don't want to know too Mm -hmm. much about it before i go in excellent devon what's coming up for you with specter cinema yeah over on specter cinema club we are uh currently diving through horror anthologies uh so we just did an episode on southbound and uh we got some uh, other really great episodes I'm super psyched on, and then that will like culminate in us doing a uh, segment tier list ranking of all the segments in VHS. So I will be getting a head start on the uh, VHS franchise for, I know we'll be 
getting there later but uh so uh yeah horror anthologies super fun time uh new episodes every tuesday um you can find me at all the usual places at underscore daddy disco excellent and for us you can find us at pod and the pendulum.com follow us on the socials at twitter at pod and pendulum instagram at pod and the pendulum uh go ahead and rate review and subscribe to us everywhere you get a podcast uh get your podcast a couple folks just left a couple nice five star reviews over on our site which was really nice which we really appreciate that that was really kind of you um said some kind things there someone left a five star review but then they wrote about some like vitamins so i don't think that was <laughs> a real review it was more a it's okay the algorithm doesn't care we'll yeah take it. <laughs> so that's all right um but we kind of hid that review um i want to shout out to emma in scotland who said some really kind things about our paranormal activity coverage so what's up emma thanks nice. for listening um and then we got a nice little email and i have to respond to the person um they left it because you can leave us messages through the site and every now and then i'll check them and i have to respond to them um they had some really kind words to say about um the the show but they took issue with my take on nancy from the nightmare on elm street series and i'd have to go back and listen to exactly what i said because it's been i think three or four years but I've referenced her as a scold, which I do remember referencing her as a bit of a scold. So I kind of do feel like that about her character. Um, I do kind of feel that she's a bit like that. So, I, But I'd have to go back and listen to exactly what I said. But she did in a kind of nice way, like take me a little bit to task for that. So I do want to respond to her at some point, hopefully in a kind of nice way, but mostly the letter, the email was really nice. And it's always awesome kind of hearing from listeners. I really do appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, patron, I did pause for the month of March, like February and March. I was just like ill for a lot of the month. So I just like focused on getting like these episodes up in like March. I paused the patron but like we got to get some stuff back up there for april maybe get a couple extra shows up if you'd like to support us in that way go to patreon.com slash pod and the pendulum we have about 50 or so hours up of bonus material up there already a lot of bonus material um there are some great new horror movies that are out that i would like to cover like late night with the devil i really want to talk to someone about with that movie so that's probably my favorite movie of the year and i'll just kind of go on and on and then someone will say but there's 30 seconds of ai in it and i will disregard it completely and then we'll start shouting at one another and then the podcast will end in tears and that'll be it all right next week we're back with paranormal activity the marked ones everybody have a fantastic week rachel devon ari thanks for spending your saturday with me and everybody take care we'll be back again bye bye